Head on Fire is a Patreon-supported podcast. Supporters of the show get early access to audio and video content, episode archives, monthly roundtables, a book club, and more. All benefits are offered on a sliding scale, so no matter your level of donation, you never miss out. If you like this show, consider supporting it with a dollar a month or whatever you can at patreon.com slash headonfirepod. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Witchcraft and magical practice have been indelible parts of the human experience throughout recorded history. Wherever there have been people, there have been people practicing magic. It shows up in all sorts of places, TV shows, fantasy novels, and that strange shop on the corner that smells of incense and has shelves lined with crystals. But what if I told you there is an actual formal discipline of study when it comes to the history and practice of magic? Owen Davies is a professor of history at the University of Hertfordshire, whose career has been spent largely researching witchcraft, magic, and ghosts. He is the president of the Folklore Society in the UK and the author of, as of this recording, 16 publications on the subject. And the reason why I had imposter syndrome the entire time I had this interview. He's considered one of the world's leading academic experts on the study of witchcraft, and he took some time out of his very busy schedule to chat with me about witch trials, the fact and fiction of real witches, and naturally, Taylor Swift. It's a fascinating interview with a personal hero of mine. Hope you enjoy. Owen Davies, thank you so much for being here on Head on Fire. Pleasure. Pleasure, Don. Thanks for the invite. Uh, So for folks who don't know you or your work, uh, tell folks a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I'm I'm a historian, social historian, cultural historian of witchcraft, magic, ghosts, magic books, grimoires, essentially the supernatural religion, uh, popular religion and popular medicine. And uh, I tend to follow this through thematically. So I will look from ancient world to the present. Uh, a lot of my research is probably, you know, from the 16th century onwards, but I always draw back and look at parallels into the ancient world, particularly also um, and the medieval period, but also I'm always interested in global comparisons and also interested in ways in which historians uh, and folklorists, and I'm also a folklorist, can draw upon other disciplines and other research, whether it's anthropology or sociology or, um, you know, biomedicine even, you know. Uh, you know, I do want to to define that term quickly. Uh, you mm-hmm. said that you're a folklorist. You're the president of the Folklore Society, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Yes, I am. Yeah, I'm currently, yeah. I mean, two years into my three-year stint as president of the Folklore Society. Well, yeah. congratulations, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Uh, I'm curious because uh, here in the U.S., at least, uh, yeah. most of us do a unit or two or, or three yeah. on uh, on mythology, uh, you know, mm. you, you get your Greek gods, maybe you do some Norse gods here or there. Um, we, we do a little bit of mythology. Folklore is different. Uh, for folks that don't know the difference between mythology and folklore, could you define the term? Well, yeah, and it's it's different in different countries. Uh, mm. You know, folklore is a discipline distinct from mythology or anthropology. All this is rooted in really quite complex history of how academic disciplines developed from the late 19th century. Um, So in America, folklore is a well-established discipline in American universities. I think some 24 different universities have MA programs in folklore. Harvard does folklore mythology, uh, for example. So it's very well established. Um, Whereas in Britain, myself and colleagues run the only MA in folklore in England. There is, there's no undergraduate programs, hardly any modules, no nothing. And all this comes down to relationships between folklore and anthropology, as I say, as, as disciplines. So what's essentially happened is, is, is that in some parts of the world, anthropology just, dom- just dom- dominated and comparative religion and comparative mythology is part of that, you know, which was a strong feature, as you say. Mm-hmm. Um, and folklore, uh, which is uh, allied, is, sometimes it's difficult to tease apart what, you know, the difference between ethno- ethnology and ethnography and anthropology and folklore. But folklore is, is, is a broad church, which, which, which can be based on field work and interviewing, just as anthropologists do, going into the field. It can be based around looking at comparative mythology as well. 
um, but also it's based on looking at legends, contemporary legends. So I, you know, I would say that, that the distinction between folklore and mythology studies or comparative religion or whatever is in a sense in the broadness of what comes under the umbrella of folklore. Um, and that's what I that's what I find quite joyous about folklore is that it, 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 you, you could take so many divergent paths in it and you're still doing folklore. You know, you've spent so much of your career uh, studying and writing about witchcraft. I, I'm curious about what what about that subject fascinates you academically? Yeah, I mean, it's a question I get asked quite a lot. You know, how did you get into studying witchcraft? Oh, well, I imagine as well. It's, it's always a difficult, it's a sort of organic, organic sort of process, you know. I mean, I guess, you know, one strand of it would be um, being interested in fantasy, reading fantasy novels, mm. you know, early on as an early teen, um, wanting to know where some of these ideas and thoughts came from, particularly the, the authors that inspired me from the fantasy world, which are people like Ursula Le Guin, um, Alan Garner, um, Jack Vance as well, actually, as a science fiction sort of folklore crossover there. Uh, so part of me was just kind of stimulated by, um, I think, fantasy literature as an early teen. Um, and then studying history, being, just being generally interested in folklore and ideas and mythology as well, which, which obviously a lot of those fantasy authors actually pick up on ancient Greek, ancient Norse mythology in particular. And so wanting to know more about that. And then as an historian, um, thinking about the importance of um, these beliefs right into the present. So, uh, you know, go back to 30 years and uh, the idea of history of witchcraft was very much considered to be an early modern topic, by early mm. modern 1450, 1750, you know, uh, and that was it. So, you know, the idea of studying the continued relevance uh, of, of belief in witchcraft and magic in the Western world, Western world, was considered to be a matter of folklore, you know, not not history. Uh, and I remember, you know, struggling as a early academic to get people to take it seriously because I was studying 18th, 19th century, 20th century uh, witchcraft and magic and say, this is just as relevant, you know, go mm -hmm. back 150, your great, great grandparents were very likely believed in witchcraft, uh, mm -hmm. very likely may have known someone who was accused as a witch. Um, at that, at that period they might not you know there's no there's no laws against witchcraft but it's relevant it's relevant to our to our ancestors lives quite more immediately and you know i showed that in a book called america bewitched where right through the 1950s 1960s people are still being shot dead uh for witchcraft in a very traditional way which you could see parallels with you know the 16th and 17th centuries so yeah, part, part of me, a lot of me is inspired by the idea that the supernatural is just as relevant and present today as it is in the past and, and that it's just, an, just as important to study it and research it and explore people who still engage with those forms of belief. Um, it's just as relevant today as it was, you know, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. I think a lot of people, certainly myself included, uh, will be really glad to hear you say that you, you came from the world of fantasy fantasy literature pop culture i mean just you know yeah. that that little spark of magic somewhere out in the world found you and you said uh, there's there has to be more here there's got yeah. to be more uh Absolutely. and and then you know sort of that fight to get it seen as a legitimate form of study i mm. i think that that um uh you know, it, it'll make people really happy because I think some folks in sort of the modern witchy circles or people who are interested in it almost feel a sense of shame <laughs> in right. saying, oh, you know, I, I came to this because I really liked practical magic or I watched mm. Sword in the Stone and I really loved mm. that. So I, I think people enjoy that 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 uh, that was your path. Speaking of modern practitioners, as you are very likely, no doubt aware, uh, there are many modern practitioners of witchcraft around the world. Uh, and oftentimes their practice stems from the work of folks like Gerald Gardner or Alistair Crowley or uh, Margaret Murray. Uh, there's this idea that modern magical practitioners or occultists are continuing an ancient tradition. Uh, how do these modern practitioners differ from the witches of history or the witches of folklore? Or is, is there indeed some kind of long, unbroken tradition of witchcraft? <laughs> uh, it's it's a really it's a really complex question, and obviously, people that like Ronald Hutton have been unpicking mm -hmm. this for for many years. And I I I I work with particularly through the work I've done on cunning folk. This is where mm -hmm. it really kind of connects with modern practitioner movements and stuff. And um, 
you know, I have to say, you know, I'm, I'm never judgmental about this because the whole point of what I'm interested in all this is because it's current, it continues. It's, it's uh, how it continues and the way which people engage with it as practitioners today is fa fascinates me just as much as in the past, but it is different. You know, you know, I, you know, I, I will, you know, absolutely clear. There is no, there is no unbroken tradition of somehow witches persecuted in the 17th century, 16th century and modern practitioners know it doesn't exist. Ger Gerald Gardner was a, was a fantasist, clever and created a movement. Nothing wrong with that. Every religion has to have a founding kind of back history. Sure. doesn't matter what, every religion has it. And there's that, so that's, that's not, it's not about being false. It's not about falsehood. It's not. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what's really interesting in the way in which um, modern magical practitioners, whether they're Wiccan or not Wiccan, and increasingly, as I've, in my academic career, I've seen a massive shift from organized religion to individual uh, pagan practitioner. That's happened in the last 30 years, you know. Um, and most of the people I speak to today who are practitioners, and I have students who are practitioners, um, belong to the kind of individuals. They don't want to be part of a hierarchy or, or a coven. Uh, and, and then there are problems with, 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 with obviously, with the degree of um, patriarchy in, in sure. early in early wicker and stuff, you know. So I think it's really been quite liberating what's happened over the last 20 years. And 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 the awareness that, you know, people like Ronald's work and stuff and, and, and others have, have shown that, that, that there, there is no one broken past, but that doesn't mean it's not legitimate. You don't need to have that. You can borrow, every religion borrows from other religions. And that's no different whether you're part of a, a grouping or chaos magicians or whatever, or you're just an individual who's engaging and, uh, has a, their own spiritual magical journeys um, borrow from it and, and and that includes you know from overseas or whatever it, it, it's, it's misplaced but you're you're creating your own understanding of the world and vision and how you want you think magic means to you and I think that's actually been uh, a really interesting and liberating aspect over the last 20 years um, from what could be seen as a rather stifling we might call first half of neo-paganism from 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 Wicker onwards, which was uh, about orders and hierarchy comes from the golden dawn. You know, you must progress through this to a more liberating hedge witch, uh, you know, head, head, the hedge witch move and stuff. So, um, so that's what that's that's my take on this. Is that no, there is no uh, there is no unbroken tradition. The people prosecuted for witchcraft and magic in the early modern period, you know, some 40 to 60,000 people, mostly women who were executed for this terrible, terrible thing, were not part of some sort of pagan cult. They were not part of, they were not even doing what they said they had been doing. So a few of them may have been involved in cursing and, and muttering curses and stuff that we know that that happened. But, um, but that doesn't necessarily gate. It's not saying that because you call yourself a witch today, there's, a, there's an issue the problem i don't have an issue with people calling themselves which which is today or practicing witchcraft today it's a, it's a malleable term it's a protean term it, mm -hmm. fine it's fine and i'm fascinated how people engage with the past uh, and engage with that history and that that's that's great and then that's you know a lot of people who read my books are practitioners and i'm fascinates me how they use historians work and vice versa i've mm -hmm. benefited from the work of practitioners particularly those who have transcribed you know, uh, magic books, 17th century, practitioners have made a really important contribution in the last 25 years to the understanding of magical practice in the past. So it's a, it should be a really positive and an interesting creative relationship. You know, you brought up uh, the witch trials and, and uh, you know, what some used to call the burning times. And I mm. have many headaches over that. Time. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> the Murrayite theory is a problem. The nine million women and yeah. all of the things. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I, uh, I I am curious because there's this idea that the that many of the witches uh, or many of the people who were burned as witches or or who were uh, prosecuted for witchcraft uh, were actually folk healers uh, yeah. or yeah. practicing medicine and and uh, things like that midwives. Um, to your knowledge, is that is that based in fact? Is you know was this a, was this a, a great battle of uh, doctors trying to you know drive out the folk healers? <laughs> no, uh, this, this is a persistent. I have to say, this is one of the persistent issues with where I have. It, it's, it is problematic the way in which a kind of a public popular understanding of it, because um, 
No, <laughs> the, short, the short answer. <laughs> yes, some. Well, it doesn't matter where across the continent. Yes, there were some. Uh, there were some midwives. There were some cunning folk, wise women, wise men. However, they're called in different countries and different cultures. Yes, a small minority in general. Overall, there are regional patterns and differences. Mm-hmm. Um, but in general, some were, a few were caught up. Uh, and mostly they were caught up in the witch trials when they were accused by their clients. In other words, someone who went to a cunning person, a wise woman, or whatever, and said, I'm bewitched, and they forked out a week's wages on a charm or whatever, and then things got worse, and they go back and said, oh, I just paid you five shillings, why, why am I still worse? Uh, and then the thing is, well, well, you probably didn't carry out the ritual well or whatever it happens to be. Uh, and in the end, after they've been sponged for all their life savings sort of thing, they go, I think you are bewitching me to take my money, etc. So quite the, the small number come from that kind of transactional relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, in, an, in, in an English concert, I've just been working recently, um, looking at this actually, um, there are a few cases where under English law, uh, which is also obviously American common law uh, into, the, into the 18th century, um, a few because there's a there's there's a line in the Elizabethan Act of 1563 and then the King James version 604, which says uh, that you could be prosecuted under the Witchcraft and Conjuration Act for detecting stolen goods and property, uh, and so you do get a few trials which come of targeting astrologers in particular, astrologer physicians, mm-hmm. but that also includes cunning folk dabbled in astrology. I've not come across one that was successful. In other words they would go to court and they would say, well, I've just published this book on astrology. No one stopped me publishing this book on astrology. <laughs> why, 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 why am I guilty of a capital offence um, when I've just been allowed to publish this? You know? So those don't work. You know? So they do get caught up in, in, in a small number of cases. Now, whenever I have this discussion, people then go, oh, what about Iceland? What about uh, Finland and Sweden? Uh, yeah, that's a different issue there because this, these are about that cultural battles between indigenous populations, uh, and in a sense, you know, Europeans. So you do get a lot of trials in Sweden and Finland against Sami shamans and indigenous shamans for practicing magic. Yeah, that happens. Uh, you can see a similar thing going on a bit in in Iceland. Um, but that, that's, those, those are discrete and different things to the bulk of the trials, which are in Central Europe. You know, that's where the bulk of, pe- bulk of people, bulk of women um, were tried. So, so yeah, no, it, it's a persistent. A lot of that myth comes from second wave feminist literature um, mm. from Ehrenreich, Barbara Ehrenreich in particular, which is very widely read in the 1970s. You still see it floating around the Internet. But, you know, any historian, any historian of gender, any historian of witchcraft will say exactly the same thing as I'm saying about this. No, it's not a persecution of midwives. No, it's not a persecution of female. Heath. It is the witch trials are a misogynistic and patriarchal uh, act uh, targeting what are seen to be the most vulnerable people susceptible to uh, the wiles of the devil. And that, that's very gendered and that's very misogynistic and patriarchal. But the facts are that no, sorry, that's a long-winded response no, to, your, to your thing, <laughs> but it, it, it's out there so much. It is, and I think I've, I've said I've said this before a number of times that you know I thought we were getting somewhere twenty-five years, and social media came along, uh, and, and all these things just become have become all over the place again. You just kind of go, oh, God. well, and I think, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I was so keen to have you on because, you know, I've been in witchcraft spaces for 20 years now. Um, mm. I'm very old. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, I, uh, you know, it, it is, it's difficult to figure out what information that you read in books or what information you see mm. on social media or in an article that's supposed to be, you know, fact-based. Yeah, I see all these articles, uh, you know, these, these sources cited. Um, but when you go down the rabbit hole a little bit, it is, it's difficult to find good information and good teachers about this information. Yeah, sure. Um, and it seems like there is as, as much as practitioners have contributed to the understanding of history or the contextualization of history, it feels like at times, at least from inside the community, um, mm. that practitioners sort of butt up against 
the academic community. They don't want mm. the academic community to be correct. Do you, does that, do you it's, find it's, that to be true? <laughs> yeah, it's still there. It's still there. I mean, it was quite strong, you know, again, 25 years ago, mm-hmm. you know, that was pretty strong there 30 years ago. Um, I think it's lessened a lot, but I think social media has, has kind of re-strengthened it a bit. I mean, yeah, there's a two-edged sword with social media because I can right. put out tweets and stuff and provide information as lots of other people do, and that's great. Um, but then the other side is this this torrent of other stuff. <laughs> social media it, doesn't it, tend to reward good information. It tends to yeah. reward things that get engagement. And well, exactly, oftentimes and those two things aren't the same. Exactly. And and there's also a tension there because academic a lot of academics are expensive, you know. Yes. And 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 the internet is cheap. And mm-hmm. um uh, so I do I do I do meet a lot of practitioners um who by and large only read practitioner histories if you sort of mean so mm-hmm. practitioner histories of the history of witchcraft mm-hmm. and um which is interesting in itself uh and part of that is due to access and if you're not an academic community how would you access all the latest research that comes out in articles and stuff sure. um and i think there's a there's a there's a role for more academics to be out on social media uh to 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 kind of counter this stuff although it's 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 often futile because some of these things are so entrenched but i think i mean my 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 main thing about here is that uh, the modern practitioner community doesn't need to have necessarily a deep history uh in terms of identification with individuals or or groups in the past um have a relationship with the ideas about magic have have a you know the ideas, the practices, um, that, you know, that's, that, that's fine. It's when you then identify with groups in the party going, well, actually, these people who, who were prosecuted in 17th century, that you know, has no relationship at all to, to pretty much any practitioner group, really, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. they're people who are accused of crimes they didn't commit. Simple as that. Um, long and short, you know, again, as, as I said, apart from the, the small number who were prosecuted by clients or attempted prosecutions for, for astrology. But it's a, it's an ongoing thing, but I think it's got a lot better. I think, I think, you know, um, I think, I think the relationship between academic scholars on this uh, and practitioners is pretty, in a quite a good place, actually. Good. Uh, I want to ask about labels. You actually brought this up earlier, and it's a, a great line of questioning. Uh, you, you said, you know, your grandparents, your great grandparents probably knew witches, uh, yeah. probably, you know, went to witches or something or sought their help. Um, there are a lot of people. Uh, half of my family is from uh, Appalachia, uh, West Virginia, the Ohio River Valley, um, that area where you would have, you know, granny magic and and that kind of thing um however none of the people in my family would have ever called themselves a witch ever you just you just whistled to get the wind to dry your laundry that's just Mm. what you did you know you hang bottles from trees or you do you know these these kinds of folk practices um let's talk about labels for a moment do do labels help do labels hurt how do you properly create a label for folks who would have never called themselves a label I mean is it is it even fair to sort of project a label onto folks who wouldn't have called themselves that yeah that's an interesting question I mean obviously the the big one is you know if you call yourself witch or whatever what sort of witch you're talking about you know in, in historical context and but that, that follows on from what we've just been talking about. And there were people, there were people called um, 17th century labeled white witches. You know? yep. so Absolutely. You call yourself a white witch. But that, mm-hmm. That's a historic term. And it was used 400 years ago. It was used 100 years ago uh, to talk about cunning folk and wise women and conjurers and stuff. Um, but as you say, there's a whole bigger world there of pop, what I call popular magic or you call it folk magic or whatever. In other words, there are specialists and you know and they are particularly specialists on witchcraft or detecting or use astrology or they might have expertise in herbal medicine they're often learned or they say they, they or they say they have powers from the fairies or they're seventh sons or seventh daughters uh, or they're learned from book magic and then there is a whole world of ritual spells which are, are communally owned in a sense you know mm-hmm. um you know, and, and call it folk magic call it popular magic or whatever 
uh, and, that, and that's commonly owned. That's passed down orally. It's sometimes it's you know people write it on the fly page of a Bible, or and obviously in the 19th century, and particularly you know the good American examples like Long Lost Friend or whatever. You know, it's it's written down. It's written down. It's printed. I'm a copy right here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've got yeah, exactly. I've got lovely, lovely copies. I love that book, and 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 it's printed. And so you know, from the early, you know, from the 18th century onwards, whether it's in France and popular grimoires there, this gets printed. So it gets democratized. So you, you, for some things, you still rely on the practitioner, the expert, the cunning person. There are some things you wouldn't possibly do unless you've been to them. And at the same time, there are lots of forms of rituals and stuff that, that people just perform because they knew about it. It had been passed down. You just say granny magic. It's a nice term, you know, uh, or, or grandpa magic. And um, those are passed down. They're held in communities, lots of herbal remedies, herbal magic, simple astrological forms of when you do things at certain times, those sorts of things. Um, and as, again, you have Christian in the 18th and 19th centuries, people resorting to cheap, popular books, like long lost friend or six or seven books of moses or whatever um so it's kind of diy it's diy so the whole idea of you know modern practice is in a sense an echo or continuation of the past where you took information where you could and you made what use what sense of it you wanted talking about uh sources and research um how much do you see the presence of circulating folklore, uh, such as like a, a magical practice as evidence of that practice versus having a historical document that presents an account of a practice as evidence of it, like a trial record uh, mm. where the motivations might be muddled due to coercion? Mm. Again, it depends what you're arguing, because we, you know, the, the, the literary archive, whether it's manuscript or printed, is only a tiny representation of the diversity of beliefs, traditions, rituals, or whatever, um, uh, which are passed down orally. So, you know, I don't, I, I, you know, I, I am a historian and a folklorist, and so some, in some sense, I will prioritise what is the evidence, what is the archival evidence. This, this. This comes into play particularly when it comes to the material culture of magic and building magic and the idea of concealments in in, in, in buildings, uh, apotropaic or whatever. And I, I have done and worked with a colleague, Kerry Holbrook, and about going, okay, what is the evidence for a practice which mm. has been assumed in the 20th and 21st centuries about the past, but there's a gap between the actual practice as archaeological and what modern interpretation is, uh, and if you if you know as a historian what the sources are, you can go back and think, okay, I'm going to do this systematically, and then you find no evidence for this practice being magical at all, you know. Uh, but it's become, and this is the thing that Kerry Holbrook and I have worked on with a book, which is called Reenchantment. In other words, a practice like concealing a horse skull or a mummified cat or whatever. Um, there's no evidence in historical record that was ever interpreted that till you get to folklore theory about survivals and pre-Christian rites and religions in folk culture in the in the late 19th century onwards. But that doesn't, again, that doesn't, it's not about being true or false because lots of people believe that a mummified cat today is an apotropaic. It's all part of belief. It's all, it's all part of how we, we've interpreted these things. So again the question you ask is raises all sorts of really interesting issues about relationship between past and present between the nature of evidence material archival printed oral um and, and, and there is no hard and fast and this is all part of a continuum of the way in which magic which was, was so fascinating a magical practice gets invented reinvented reimagined and that's ongoing it's ongoing you know uh there's an interesting point that you bring up that is sort of a hot topic on social media in the last few years. And it is about ownership and culture and which cultures own, you know, what practices and where do practices come from and sort of finding, you know, where was this invented and who yeah. owns this and, yeah. and that kind of thing, cultural appropriation and all of that. Mm. Um, it is difficult, at least as far as I have found in my own research and attempts to, to understand the matter, um, to find where certain things do originate. Like you said, mm. you know, you, there are, there are topics that when you, when you research them, you find 
well, I don't know when that became magical. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah, it just absolutely. seems to have started as a this. Yeah. And then, you know, very Seinfeld, yada, 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 <laughs> yeah. 300 years, now it's witchcraft. <laughs> Do yeah. you find that to be true? Oh, yeah. You know, you're absolutely right. Because a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of this, a lot of um, beliefs practices where you, you can't pinpoint the origin. You can't. Uh, you know, and those those are the gaps in which people have the imagination to say they're pre-Christian or whatever. Mm. You know, um, often there's no actual evidence for that, but there's then there's no evidence when it actually started. You know, um, so you 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 come back to much broader principles of notions and ideas, um, and, and you know, and lots of people have worked on this and saying you know there there are there are aspects that of medieval post-medieval belief and tradition think about the green man or um yeah green man representations in english churches medieval churches or whatever and there's been a long debate about that as to whether are they are they pre-christian representations that have survived or not but there's plenty of evidence to say they are basically christian in the christian era not about paganism but other broader notions about nature and and, and mm. god's world you know um, I mean, I've, we've, we've just working on a big project on witch bottles, and that's a good example of what you're talking about. You know, where in fact I think I have got back to a kind of a uh, uh, sort of initial where it came from um, around the 1640s. This is these are the you know the Bellamine witch bottles with uh, mm -hmm. bearded man, Bartman, and Nex, which you know, and, and and obviously that's spawned hundreds of TikTok and YouTube videos oh, about man. making your own witch bottles and stuff. You know, oh, there's yeah. lots of stuff. It's great. It's great. I mean, I spent hours watching some of that stuff. You know, it's fascinating, <laughs> what, people, it's fascinating what people are doing. But, you know, it, it, it draws back on this idea of the Bartman bearded man bottles, you know, as being the kind of the, the originator of this. Um, but I think I have probably come across, but that's only about the bottling. All the other aspects of it, using urine, putting pins and needles, nails mm. in it, sharp objects, sympathetic magic putting on the fire that dates back further is it where does it begin where does it begin you know someone somewhere in the 1640s decides to put it in a stoneware bottle put a cork in it and roughly do the same things you might do in an open pan in in the netherlands and 100 years earlier mm. or evidence of a 15th century italian um prosecution where he's doing fairly similar stuff using urine putting sharp objects in it as a kind of curse ritual he gets prosecuted so you know so much of magic is about symbols it's about unit construction to put it in a rather rather unmagical way there's, there's, there's units of how whether in ancient world or today um, different aspects of of magic can be put together recreated like 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 lego or whatever and reformulate mm -hmm. and that's that's the wonder of it that's why it's that's why it's so vibrant it, trying to find an er version or you know the the origin whether it's pre-christian or christian or whatever sometimes just becomes irrelevant because you can't the platonic <laughs> ideal of this particular yeah you can't, you can't. <laughs> exactly and 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 and, and uh, you know you you could look at this you know in a comparative way with biblical scholarship and mm -hmm. the ways in which you know a certain genre of biblical scholarship has tried to prove where the ark is you know, tried to prove the parting of the red sea uh, that's not what it's about and you can't prove it and it's futile you can understand the biblical legends without having to try and find dubious material evidence that it happened at some certain point through excavation what do people keep getting wrong about Salem? You've written a lot about Salem over the years. Uh, it, it seems to be a, a, a pet topic of yours. What do we keep getting wrong about it? Um, I don't think it's about being wrong about it. I, I guess my frustration with it um, is how it dominates um, mm. American perceptions. And that comes through because of the schooling system, the way in which Salem has become this iconic moment. In, mm whether it's the American Revolution, the Civil War, Salem, these are these key points where America moves on, you know, mm. um, from one era to another. Uh, and, and it becomes problematic because Salem is, in a sense, exceptional. So in other words, all those scholars working on 17th century colonial America can point to other episodes 
you know, before Salem, which are mm. more typical. Uh, and from my perspective is that, yeah, Salem's fascinating. Is, and it, one of the reasons actually it's fascinating is, is, is because how soon after people are going, oh my God, we got it wrong there, you know. Um, I yes uh, in in um, researching a show a, a couple of years ago I was sort of going back through information about Salem and I had completely forgotten how brief it was yeah, yeah. It, yeah. it's just a blip in history I mean it, it almost yeah. didn't happen <laughs> we we've had weather patterns that lasted longer than the witch hunt in Salem <laughs> yeah it's 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 very late in a in a western in the western sort of chronology of, of mass witch trials uh, it's very late due to very specific which has been studied in millions and millions of pages mm-hmm. uh, and in one sense that's great we can't you can't study an episode any more than it has been studied uh yeah literally you know um 20 years on they're actually offering payments to to family members of those who were executed it's like no never it's the salem never again never again Even sure. never, never again the burning time absolutely <laughs> exactly and and yet and yet you know american society is you know massive development so you know, my point is is that you know okay 1690 go to 1890 massive population you've got you know you've got over 100 different nationalities you know, massive european movements of population in the 19th century and they all bring their folk traditions customs and concerns about witchcraft uh and you know, as I've shown in the sort of America of Witch, you know, I've only probably t- you know, touched the, the 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 sort of top of the iceberg on the number of local trials in the 19th century. Uh, again, which I would call reverse witch trials, which is people have been accused, abused, assaulted for being supposed witches, who then prosecute. Um, so this is ongoing. You know, this 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 is an ongoing history. And to only focus on Salem and colonial America is, is I find, well, I mean, it's not just about America, it's, it's about other countries as well. It's mm-hmm. problematic to think that we moved beyond that. Yeah. Mm. We moved beyond. Salem happened and then that was it. That was the end of the witch trials and we all realized how, how mad it was, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and yet, you know, uh, 200 years on, um, people are still being killed in America. Or sure. in Europe as, and in Europe as well. And then the satanic uh, panic swept through. Yeah, no, it's right. 1970s evangelicals, you know, uh, whipping up concerns 80s, 90s about, and today. <laughs> and today, exactly, exactly. And, um, you know, how far are we? How far are we from people being, you know, I, I, I once, I kind of did a, you know, I put out something on social very briefly and I took it down because I didn't want the hassle. It was basically saying, uh, in the current state of things in America, not just in America, again, things in Britain aren't too good either on these sorts of things. Uh, uh, basically saying if someone, you know, if, if a leading American politician, we won't name names, basically said, um, we've got a problem with witches in our communities today. You can, you can imagine within, within weeks there will be abuse, um, problems across large swathes, millions of people. Uh, it only takes a few, it only takes that sort of messaging and we're kind of back into a similar situation. And that, that's, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm just using, because we're talking about Salem, but that, that's elsewhere, you know, that's elsewhere. It's, the veneer is thin and the idea that we've progressed beyond the, these things is I think dangerous. Well, and, and uh, politicians do still talk about witches and witch hunts. Yeah. And, and uh, but, but even more so, especially here in the United States where politics and religion is, mm. is so intertwined yeah, you do have maybe not necessarily the politician themselves but their advisors who happen to be religious figures pastors you know these yeah. giant mega churches uh you know who do give sermons and say that there are witches out there actively doing work against this politician or actively doing work against the church we just had one this past year i forget mm. his name off the top of my head but um uh, it it does still happen, and it raises a lot of concern for folks. Yeah, and and the interesting thing in the contemporary context is, of course, there are now hundreds of thousands of people who who are self identify as witches and magical mm-hmm. practitioners, you know, uh, and hundreds of books, and and you're part of that. You're part of that. <laughs> I wrote so, so one. <laughs> it, it, yeah, you know, but it's a fascinating dynamic where you've 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 got people who self identify at the same time. Mm-hmm. You've still got what you might. I, I'm not even going to go into old mentality, a continuing mentality. Mm-hmm. That there are these others who have will profess these these powers, so it's 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 you know it all this is still current and yet 
the context changes from people who are, in a sense, um, part of a supposed conspiracy in the mm-hmm. past, and that's what that's what that's what led to the laws against witchcraft. It's about conspiracy, and yet here we are today with other conspiracies, five G or <laughs> American elections or you know whatever, yep. and uh, uh, um, and you you can see the parallels there and going, there's this whole community of, of, really, of, of people who are practicing magic. At what point does that cross over and start, you know? Well, I think you're correct. The, the, the context is important. And, and like, you know, our earlier chat about labels and of, of yeah. you know, saying that people are witches or what words mm. people would choose for themselves. The context of what someone means when they say the word witch is very, yeah. very important to modern magical practitioners saying that they're a witch is, you know, saying one very specific, slightly ambiguous thing. Um, yeah. But what these political folks say when they mean witches is something very different. What people say when, oh, witches are being, tri-, you know, the witches that were put on trial, that's a very different thing as well, mm. which seem, which is a, a, a word that we keep trying to ascribe mm. meaning to and, sh- and and the witch just doesn't want to be defined i don't know no absolutely very potent and, and obviously with donald trump and witch mm. hunt and the witch hunt thing I, you know I, I use that as an example i'm talking mm. about thinking with history for our students and thinking with history and i use that example of going here we are and witch hunt has become a massive thing and there's very i come one of the american news spaces to really think oh, about yeah. a witch hunt tracker sure you know, <laughs> you know it was a really interesting tool uh, to then compare with saying, uh, what does this, what does the witch hunt today mean today, and how is it being used in the context, and what does it mean to people who are self-defined as witches, and how they're reacting to the way in which this is being used today? So, so, so current, yeah. What does the average layperson get wrong about witches? You know, maybe not practitioners necessarily, but what, what do you know? What does the average person get wrong about witches and history and folklore? The main one is the conflation between between witches as a label applied to others in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. No one, practically no one, self-defined as a witch in the 6th, 17th century because it's it's a capital offence. Even in the 19th century, no one would say, I'm a witch, I practice witchcraft, um, because it was, it, it's considered malign. It's, you know, you're going to get beaten up for it. Um, so... But there are these people called cunning folk or conjurers or wizards or magical practitioners or folk healers or whatever. So people are doing stuff, lots of stuff, lots, providing lots of magical services. They're not identifying as witches, they're not calling themselves witches. Occasionally they get accused of witchcraft. And that conflation continues as very strong today um, still. Um, and I think kind of does a disservice to the, those accused in the past. And at the same time, neglects the importance of magical practitioners in the past as well. You see what I mean? Um, so yeah, what th- those who are accused and executed are labelled as th- for doing things, crimes they didn't commit. And at the same time, there's a large group of people who are also maligned, uh, supposed witches by witch hunters and governments who are actually doing good things for communities, as they sit. And then you have and folks like John D. in the court of Queen Elizabeth doing whatever she yeah, wanted. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, for, you know, for an elite, but for the vast majority of people, it's your local cunning folk who's probably about, you know, maybe in your village, but maybe five, 10 miles away, who's going to um, deal with your love problems, who's going to detect the, the horse that was stolen, um, sure. you know, the identity of the thief that, that, that broke into your, your cottage, who's going to deal with your bewitched cow, who, you know, who, who's going to provide you with herbal medicines, going to provide you with charms, is going to provide, uh, and, those people, you know, one of the reasons they rarely get prosecuted is people don't want to prosecute in a, in a, in a, in a common law. This is about, so a lot of this is about legalism, uh, you mm-hmm. know, in America and, and Britain's common law, it requires an accusation from someone to go to a magistrate for it to end up in court. It doesn't happen very, re- you know, very, very occasionally because people value these people in their communities, but they're not witches as they understand it. You know, that's, so that that that's that's the challenge, um, and as I, I don't, that, that doesn't mean I don't have I don't have any issue with someone calling them self-defining as a witch today because many of them self-define and go actually I'm a cunning person, mm-hmm. and the, the term white witch provides this sort of you know bridging uh, terminology. 
it is interesting that you bring up the the subject of class because like you said for the elite even though it might be illegal or frowned upon or uh you know something like that the queen can still have her court magician and and magic is always still accessible for for the ultra rich there's certainly a class uh thing there for for access um so uh, uh another question uh like i said i want to be respectful of your time I've written a book about witchcraft. I've hosted a, a podcast that's talked to a whole lot of uh, self-described witches over the years. Um, and I am asked uh, a lot, a lot, uh, if somebody is brand new, if if they have read their own fantasy books and, and uh, they have seen their movies and they are also inspired to find a little spark of magic out in the world, where do they start? And I feel like you would have a really interesting answer to that. <laughs> If somebody was interested in learning more about witchcraft and magic, where would you send them? What books or resources would you send them to? Oh, yeah. Other than I mean, your own books, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not going to promote those. That's right. Um, I, th- I think I think it's a, it's a dual path here, and I think lots of practitioners have taken this dual path as well. Uh, and one is to read how over the last century. Well, three parts actually. How, how over the last century in the Western world, modern occult magic developed. You know, whether it's the Golden Dawn through to Wicca, through to Hedge Witchcraft, all the mm-hmm. other variations in between. Uh, what, is, what is it those past practitioners who have developed modern practice have, have drawn upon? So that's important. And what is it? What are, you know, how have they constructed their rituals? Two is to recognize that a lot of that history is also based on um, exploring and understanding other cultures. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and and modern Western magic is based on, obviously, you know, know, with theosophy, et cetera, and Eastern mysticism, often very badly interpreted, uh, very badly interpreted. Um, And also, obviously, then with the rise of understanding of hieroglyphs and Egyptian magic and Egyptian ritual and ritual and magic. So, so you need to understand that, explore your own pathway through how early modern practitioners have used the past and drawn upon it for inspiration. And then thirdly, um, read the history, read the modern history. Um, read what modern historians and anthropologists are writing about the meaning of magic have, have, have contextualized the early practitioners contextualize and understand interactions quite going back a long way between European culture and Eastern cultures and African cultures um, which is a long long history which doesn't get explored that much so it's a kind of yeah three three pathways there um, and I think you'll come to re- you'll come to a really good place about where you want to situate yourself um but but do read the academic work do read the if you can you know and there is lots out there which is um, available open access there are lots of phd theses you can now access open access they may not be there may be a dry read <laughs> <laughs> you know and 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 I, that is an issue that is, and i mean you know I've, I've had that in the past i write academic but i have to write academic books because i have to submit to research assessment exercises and government exercises publisher so parents i have to write them. Exactly. I have to, I have to write like that. We all have to write like that because it's our livings. And, uh, have you tried writing like that while doing a TikTok dance? Have you? <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't got, I haven't got to TikTok yet. No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a by, I'm a bystander on TikTok. Yeah. But yeah, so it, it's those three ways into it, I, I would suggest. And I think a lot of, a lot of practitioners come there naturally anyway, to that position of. What do you think magic is? I uh, can't answer that one. <laughs> oh, can't answer that. Listen, one. my editor, t- I wrote a whole draft of a book and I didn't want to define it. And she's like, you have to. And I was yeah. like, I hate you. So you have to as well. Yeah. Because you're the no, expert yeah. here, sir. Yeah, no, I mean, I wrote, I wrote a book, whatever, 10 years called Magic, a very short introduction. Mm-hmm. And um, you also wrote a book called Paganism, a very short introduction. Yeah, I did. That's right. I did both. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I probably can't. I can't say any more. You know, 10, 10 whatever, twelve years on, I probably can't do any better than that. Um, 
because it is a matter of perspective mm -hmm. and all, all I can all I can do is set you out the context that's what I do I set out the context I say this this is how magic is understood in the past by different cultures different groups at different periods at different times how you personally understand it is is kind of up to you um and, and in, in one sense you know great if you're going to be informed by all those different historical cultural parameters and perceptions but you know lots of people will come up with their own definition quite individually out of their own imagination or so, and i'm i i uh, yeah i can't i can't you can't i'm not the sort of historian that tries to impose that i'm not trying to find solutions i'm just exploring and explaining and providing people giving giving context and giving information and then find your way find your own pathway to what you think magic is um because you'll never get to a, a definition that anyone's unanimously going to agree <laughs> agree with and let let alone the relationship between religion and magic or religion magic and science you know so that's that's very true <laughs> putting yeah. putting literally any definition down into black and white is uh, terrifying because you just know it's going to be picked yeah apart. exactly you're you're going you, you, you're never going to please people and people are going to be you're not about it <laughs> yes, you are. Uh, you have studied witchcraft and magic for a very long time. Um, have you ever done any yourself? And if not, do you have a favorite spell that you've read? Um, no, I mean, I'm not a practitioner. Uh -huh. uh, and the, I do keep a few items. So I have three, for example, I have a collection of charms, particularly some most coming from research and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, for a particularly first world war research i did on soldiers charms and talismans and stuff i do have um three echinoids which are three fossilized sea urchins on the windowsill mm -hmm. uh, uh just as a carrying on a tradition which is about uh, uh, protection um and i have in the past had a reproduction of a welsh cunning folks charm from the early 19th century which i did put above the threshold so yeah, you know, it's. I'm not. I, I don't. I'm not uh, divorced from it. Although I'm not a practitioner, put it that way. Do you believe <laughs> in it? Do you believe in magic? Well, that comes back to what is magic, isn't it? Sure. But, but, yeah, yeah. I, but put it this way: I'm. I don't practice magic. Um, I'm very much uh, a secular, secular outlook on things. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think magic is inherent in the human condition. Mm. however it's expressed and that magic can be through fiction and fantasy it can be how you talk to children and explain things to children i think that's one of the more fascinating aspects of how magic is inherently human um is you know people who explain to their kids i don't have kids but people who explain to their kids about you know why does an airplane work daddy or mummy uh, and then you come up with some ridiculous explanation which bears no relationship to to airfoil en engines or whatever in engineering so in other words every you know people resort to magical explanations people want to be have a magical why are we seeing why are we see such a resurgence in ufo interest you know <laughs> <laughs> you know i've been through all that before in the 1970s you know uh but here we are again and it's because people want to believe there is something out there that people want to believe so i to me magic is inherent and however it's expressed i don't see it as negative it can be negative it can be positive um, but it's i think magical thinking um, believing in magic, which is not necessarily the same thing as magical thinking, uh, is just inherent. It's an empire. This is why I don't subscribe to, uh, you know, Richard Dawkins and science is all, and uh, you know, and uh, you know, religion is evil, and we must quash religion and magic because we're in an age. It's rubbish, rubbish. Where you know, um, science can be much as much a matter of magic and belief and religion as. As, as science is part of you know magic is a part of science in the past you know so, so long-winded which shows you just how difficult it is to to talk about magic uh you know in a more general sense because it's so personal final question and i'll let you go uh you are the president of the folklore society and uh with that comes i i, I feel like uh you're one of the only people who could answer this question <laughs> In 2020, uh, 
Uh, Taylor Swift, or should I yeah. say, after today, who got her honorary doctorate, Dr. Taylor Swift. Oh, right. Okay, I hadn't seen that. Right. Yeah, okay. apparently she got an honorary doctorate <laughs> today. Okay. Uh, they were recording this. Uh, so Dr. Taylor Swift yeah. put out an album of music called Folklore yeah. and did a whole big promotion on social yeah. media with it, taking over the infamous Folklore Thursday oh, hashtag yeah, on yeah. Twitter, yeah. Yeah. which upset the very stuffy uh, academic folklorist yeah. community. So I have a question. Do you have beef with Taylor Swift? And if <laughs> so, how do you settle that beef? No, I've got no beef. I did, I did tweet about that and I did tweet her directly as president of the Folklore <laughs> Society. And I said, it's great you're interested in talking about folklore, you know, with, through music and song. Um, great if you could do a bit of promo for folklore, the discipline uh, thingy. So no, no, you know, it, it was inter- it was fascinating how that all blew up. Um, and as I say, as president of the Folklore Society, I think, and my, 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 my colleagues and members of the society generally thought it was a really positive thing, uh, has to be said. Um, it's just a shame if she'd only put out a statement supporting the American Folklore Society, <laughs> you know, the, the British Folklore Society, and the, the great work we've been doing over the years, then that would have, that would have been better. I do appreciate the official finger wag from yeah, the president exactly. of the Folklore oh, yeah. Society. <laughs> <laughs> Owen Davies, thank you so much for being here uh, okay, on Head on sure. Fire. It has been an honor getting to speak with you. Um, you're a personal hero of mine. So thank you so much uh, for your pleasure. time. Okay, thanks for the invite. <laughs> bye now. Okay, bye. That's going to wrap up this episode of Head on Fire. My eternal gratitude to my guest today, Owen Davies. Uh, Do please go follow him on social media. You will not regret it. If you like this show and you want to support it, there are a number of ways to help. Share it with your friends on social media. You can also like or rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts or Spotify and leave a review. Reviews help recommend the show to other listeners just like you. Help keep the show free and producing regularly by joining my Patreon on a monthly basis. Patrons receive additional audio and video content, as well as archived episodes, a private Discord server, and a monthly book club. Sign up at patreon.com slash headonfirepod. Or if social media is your thing and you'd like to follow me, I'm pretty much at headonfirepod everywhere. Thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for downloading or streaming the show. And remember... Just because you know how something works doesn't mean it isn't magic.